Hello, everybody! It is time for Horror Month 2018, and what better way to celebrate this month than by talking about a franchise that has lasted 40 years and is coming back to the big screen this month with a brand new movie. That's right, it's Halloween! <laughs> so, let's go back in time and review the original Halloween from 1978. <laughs> Here we go. In 1963, on Halloween night in the midwestern town of Haddonfield, Illinois, Michael Myers, dressed in a clown costume and mask, inexplicably stabs his older sister Judith to death with a kitchen knife in their home. He subsequently hospitalized at, Warren's, at Warren County Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Fifteen years later, on the night of October 30th, 1978, Michael's child psychiatrist, Dr. Sam Loomis, and his colleague, Marion Chambers, arrive at Smith's Grove Sanitarium to escort Michael to court. Michael escapes from the sanitarium, stealing Loomis's car. Returning home to Haddonfield, Michael kills a mechanic for his uniform and steals a white mask, knives, and rope from a local hardware store. The next day on Halloween, Michael stalks high school student Lori Strode after she and local boy Tommy Doyle drop off the key at the former Myers house. The home is being sold by Lori's father, a real estate broker. Throughout the day, Lori notices Michael following her, but her friends Annie Braggett and Linda Van Der Klok dismiss her concerns. Loomis arrives in Haddonfield in search of Michael, knowing his intentions. After discovering that Judith Meyer's headstone has been stolen from local cemetery, Loomis meets with Annie's father, Sheriff Lee Braggett. The two begin their search at Michael's house, where Loomis tries to warn the skeptical sheriff about the danger Michael poses. Explain that Michael is pure evil and capable of further violence, despite years of catatonia. Sheriff Brackett patrols the streets while Loomis waits and watches the house, expecting Michael to return there. Later that night, Lori goes over to babysit Tommy, while Annie babysits Lindsay Wallace just across the street, unaware that Michael has followed them. When Annie's boyfriend, Paul, call calls her to come and pick him up, she takes Lindsay over to the Doyle house to spend the night with Lori and Tommy. Annie's just about to leave in her car when Michael, who's sewn away in the back seat, strangles her before slitting her throat, killing her. Soon after, Linda and her boyfriend Bob Sims arrive at the Wallace house. After having sex, ooh, Bob goes downstairs to get a beer for Linda, but Michael stabs him with a knife which pins him to the wall, killing him. Michael then poses as Bob in a ghost costume and confronts Linda, who teases him, having no effect. Linda calls Lori. Just as Lori picks up, Michael strangles Linda to death with the telephone cord. Meanwhile, Loomis discovers the stolen car and begins combing the streets. Suspicious, Lori goes over to the Wallace house. There she finds the corpses of Annie, Bob, and Linda in an upstairs bedroom, as well as, Judith, as, well as Judith Meyer's headstone. Horrified, Lori cowers in the hallway, when Michael suddenly appears and attacks her, slashing her arm. Barely escaping, Lori races back to the Doyle house. Michael gets in and attacks her again, but Lori manages to fend him off long enough for Tommy and Lindsay to escape. Lori defends herself by stabbing him with a knitting needle, a metal hanger, and his own knife, but Michael reanimates and attacks Lori. Loomis sees the two children fleeing the house and goes to investigate, finding Michael and Lori fighting upstairs. Loomis shoots Michael six times, knocking him off the balcony. When Loomis goes to check Michael's body, he finds it missing. Loomis stares off into the night, while Lori begins sobbing in terror. Hoo-wee! That's a way to start off a franchise, huh? So let's, an so let's analyze this, this movie by talking about its themes. Many criticisms of Halloween and other slasher films come from postmodern academia. So feminist critics, according to historian Nicholas Rogers, quote, have seen the slasher movie since Halloween as debasing women in a manner as hard in a, in as decisive a manner as hardcore pornography. Critics such as John Kenneth Muir state that female characters such as Laurie Strode survive not because of, quote, any good planning or growing resourcefulness, but sheer luck. Although she manages to repel the killer several times in the end, Strode is rescued in Halloween and Halloween 2 when Dr. Loomis arrives to shoot Myers. Other feminist scholars such as Carol J. Clover argue that despite the violence against women, Halloween and other slasher films turned women into heroines. In many pre-Halloween horror films, 
Women are depicted as helpless victims and are not safe until they are rescued by a strong, masculine hero. Despite the fact that Luma saves Strode, Clover's just a Halloween initiates the role of the final girl, who ultimately triumphs in the end. Strode fights back against Myers and severely wounds him. Had Myers been a normal man, Strode's attacks would have killed him. Even Loomis, the male hero of the story, who shoots Michael repeatedly at near point blank range with a large caliber gun, cannot kill him. Aviva Briefo argued that moments such as when Michael's face was temporarily revealed are meant to give pleasure to the male viewer. Briefo further argues that these moments are masochistic in nature and give pleasure to men because they are willing submit, willingly submitting themselves to the women of the film. They submit themselves temporarily because it will make their return to authority even more powerful. Critics, such as Pat Gill, see Halloween as a critique of American social values. She remarks that parental figures are mostly entirely absent throughout the film, noting that when Laurie is attacked by Michael while babysitting, quote, no, par no, no parents, either of the teenagers or of the children, are le left in their charge, called to check on their children or arrive to keen over them. Another major film theme found in the film is the dangers of premarital sex. Clover believes that killers and slasher films are fueled by a, quote, psychosexual fury and that all the killings are sexual in nature. She reinforces this idea by saying that, quote, guns have no place in slasher films, and when examining the film I spit on your grave, she notes that, quote, a hands-on killing answers to hands-on rape in a way that a shooting, even a shooting preceded by a humiliation, does not. Equating sex with violence is important in Halloween and the slasher genre, according to Pat Gill, who made a note of this in her essay, The Monstrous Years, Teens, Slasher Films, and Family. She works that Lori's friends, quote, think of their babysitting jobs as opportunities to drink, to share drinks in bed with their boyfriends. One by one they are killed by Michael Myers, an asylum escapee who years ago, at the age of six, murdered his sister for preferring sex to taking care of him. Oh boy. The dangers of suburbia is another major theme that runs throughout the film and the slasher genre at large. Paco states that slasher films, quote, seem to mock white flight to gated mock white flight to gated communities, and particularly the attempts of parents to shield their children from the dangerous influences represented by the city. Halloween and slasher films generally represent the underside of suburbia. Myers is raised in a suburban household, and after he escapes the mental hospital, he returns to his hometown to kill again. Michael, yeah, Myers is a product of the suburban environment. Carpenter himself dismisses the notion that Halloween is a morality play, regarding it merely as a horror film. According to Carpenter, critics, critics quote, completely miss the point here. He explains, quote, The one girl who is the most sexually uptight just keeps stabbing this guy with a long knife. She's the most sexually frustrated. She's the one that, that's killed him. Not because she's a virgin, but because all that sexual repressed energy starts coming out. She uses all those phallic symbols on the guy. I guess you could say that. Let's get the aesthetic elements here. A story Nicholas Rogers notes that the film the film critics contended that Carpenter's direction and camera made Halloween a quote resounding success. Roger Ebert remarks, quote, It's easy to create violence on the screen, but it's hard to do it well. Carpenter is uncannily skilled, for example, at the use of foregrounds in his compositions, and everyone who likes thrillers know that knows that foregrounds are crucial. The opening title, featuring a jack lantern placed against a black backdrop, sets the mood for the entire film. The camera slowly moves forward towards the jack lantern's left eye as the main title theme plays. After the camera fully closes in, the jack lantern jack lantern slides dim and goes out. Film historian J.P. Tillo, Tillo says that this scene, quote, clearly announces that the film's primary concern will be with the way in which we see ourselves and others and the consequences that often attend our usual manner of perception. Carpenter's first-person point-of-view compositions are, were employed with Steadicam. Tillot argues, quote, As a result of this shift in perspective from a disembodied nar narrative camera to an actual character's eye, we are forced into a deeper sense of participation in the ensuing action. Along with the 1974 Canadian horror film Black Christmas, Halloween made use of seeing events through the killer's eyes. Mm -hmm. The first scene of the young Michael's voyeurism is followed by the murder of Judith seen through the eye holes of Michael's clown costume mask. According to scholar Nicholas Rogers, Carpenter's quote, frequent use of this unmounted first-person camera to represent the killer's point of view 
attentive viewers to adopt the murderer's, murderer's assaultive gaze and to hear his heavy breathing and plodding footsteps as he stalked his prey. Film analysts have also noted its delayed or withheld representations of violence, characterized as the quote, false startle, or the quote, they will tap on the shoulder routine, in which the stalkers, murderers, or monsters quote, lunge into our field of vision or creep, on a, creep up on a person. Critic Susan Starks described the film's opening sequence in her 1978 review. In a single wonderfully fluid tracking shot, the camera establishes the quiet character of a suburban street, the sexual hanky-panky going on between a teenage couple in one of the sta staid-looking homes, the departure of the boyfriend, a hand in the kitchen drawer removing a butcher's knife, the view on the way upstairs from the uh, from behind the isolates of Halloween mask, the murder of a half-nude young girl seated at her dressing table, the descent downstairs, and whammo! The killer stands speechless on the lawn, holding the bloody knife. A small boy in a Santa Clown suit with a newly returned parent on each side shrieking in an attempt to find out what the spectacle means. Uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, let's look at the production of this episode. I mean, the production of this movie. I don't know why I said episode. I meant to say movie. The production of this movie. Here we go. After being Carpenter's film was sold on Precinct 13 at the Milan Film Festival, independent film producers Erwin Yablon's and financier Mustafa Akkad sought out Carpenter to direct a film for them by a psychotic killer that stalked babysitters. In an interview with Fangori magazine, Yablon stated, quote, I was thinking that would make sense in the horror genre, and what I wanted to do was make a picture that had the same impact as The Exorcist. Carpenter agreed to direct the film contingent on his having full creative control, and was paid a ten and was paid ten thousand dollars for his work, which included writing, directing, and scoring the film. He and his then girlfriend Deborah Hill began drafting a story originally titled *The Babysitter Murders*. Yelba subsequently suggested setting the movie on Halloween night and naming it *Halloween* instead, to which Carpenter agreed. It took approximately ten days to write the screenplay. Holy crap! Yablons and Akkad ceded most of the creative control to writers Carpenter and Hill, whom Carpenter wanted as producer. The Yablons did offer several suggestions. According to Fangoria interview with Hill, quote, Yablons wanted the script written like a radio show with booze every ten minutes. By Hill's recollection, the script took three weeks to write, and much of the inspiration behind the plot came from Celtic traditions of Halloween, such as the festival of Samhain. Although Samhain is not mentioned in the plot in the first film, Hill asserts that the, ideas, the idea was that you couldn't kill evil, and that was how we came about the story. We went back to the old idea of Samhain, that Halloween was the night where all the souls are let out to wreak havoc on the living, and then came up with a story about the most evil kid who ever lived. And when John came up with this fable of a town with a dark secret of someone who once lived there, and how that evil came back, that's what made Halloween work. Hill Hill, who worked as a babysitter during her teenage years, wrote most of the female's char female characters' dialogue. While Carpenter drafted Loomis's speeches on the soullessness of Michael Myers, many script details were drawn from Carpenter and Hill's own backgrounds and early careers. The fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois, was derived from Haddonfield, New Jersey, where Hill was raised, while several of the street names were taken from Carpenter's hometown of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Lori's Road was allegedly the name of one of Carpenter's old girlfriends, while Michael Myers was the name of an English producer who had previously entered with Yablans, assault on Precinct 13 at various European film festivals. Homage was is also paid to Alfred Hitchcock with two characters' names. Tommy Doyle is named after Lieutenant Detective Thomas J. Doyle from Rear Window, and Dr. Loomis's name was derived from Sam Loomis from Psycho, the boyfriend of Marion Crane. Sheriff Lee Bracker was shared the name of a Hollywood screenwriter and frequent collaborator of Howard Hawks. In devising the story for the film's main villain, for the film's villain, Michael Myers, Carpenter drew on haunted house folklore that exists in many, many small American communities, quote, Most small towns have a kind of haunted house story of one kind or another, he stated. Quote, At least that's what teenagers believe. There's always a house down the lane that someone was killed in or that someone went crazy in. Carpenter's inspiration for the evil that Michael would, would embody came from a visit he had taken during college to a psychiatric institution in Kentucky. There, he visited a ward with his psychology classmates where the 
where, quote, the most serious mentally ill patients were held. Among those patients was an adolescent boy with such a blank, schizophrenic stare. Carpenter's experience would inspire the characterization that Loomis would give of Michael to Sheriff Brackett in the film. The cast of Halloween included veteran actor Donald Pleasance and then unknown actress Jamie Lee Curtis. The low budget limited the number of big names that Carpenter could attract, and most of the actors received very little compensation for their roles. Pleasance was paid the highest amount of $20,000, Curtis received $8,000, and Nick Castle earned $25 a day. The role of Dr. Loomis was originally intended for Peter Cushing, who had recently appeared as Grandma Tolkien in Star Wars. Cushing's agent rejected Carpenter's offer due to the low salary. Christopher Lee was also pushed for the role. He too turned it down, although the actor later told Carpenter and Hill that declining the role was the biggest mistake he made during his career. Yelbuns then suggested Pleasance, who agreed to start because his daughter Lucy, a guitarist, had enjoyed an assault on Precinct 13 for Carpenter's score. Hmm. In an interview, Carpenter admits that, quote, Jamie Lee wasn't the first choice for Lori. I had no idea who she was. She was 19 and in a TV show at the time, but I didn't watch TV. He originally wanted to cast Anne Lockhart, the daughter of June Lockhart from last year as Lori Strode. However, Lockhart had commitments to several other film, film and television projects. Hill says of learning that Jamie Lee was the daughter of psycho actress Janet Lee, quote, I knew casting Jamie Lee would be great publicity for the film because her mother wasn't psycho. Curtis was cast in the part, though she initially had reservations as she identified as she felt she identified more with the other female characters. Quote, I was very much a smart Alec and was a cheerleader in high school, so I felt very concerned that I was being considered for the quiet, repressed young woman when in fact I was very much like the other two girls. Other relatively unknown actresses another relatively unknown actress, Nancy Keyes, Credit in the film as Nancy Loomis, was cast as Lori's outspoken friend Annie Brackett, daughter of Haddonfield Sheriff Lee Brackett. Keys had previously starred in Assault on Precinct 13, as at Cyphers, and happened to be dating Halloween's art director Tommy Lee Wallace when the film began. Carpenter chose P.J. Souls to play Linda, Vander Linda Vanderclock, another loquacious friend of Lori's. Best remembered in the film for her dialogue, peppered with the word totally. Souls was an actress known for her supporting role in Carrie and her minor part in The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. According to Souls, she was told after being cast that Carpenter had written the role with her in mind. Souls' then husband, act Souls then hus husband actor Dennis Quaid, was considered for the role of Bob Sims, Linda's boyfriend, but was unable to perform the role due to prior work commitments. The role of The Shape, SMS Michael Myers' character, was built in the end credits was played by Nick Castle, who befriended Carpenter while they attended the University of Southern California. After Halloween, Castle became a director, taking on the helms, helm of such films as The Last, Starfire, Last Starfighter, The Boy Who Could Fly, Dennis the Menace, and Major Pain. Huh. That's interesting. Akkad agreed to put up $300,000 for the film's budget, which was considered low at the time. Carpenter's previous film, Assault on Precinct 13, had an estimated budget of $100,000. Akkad worried over the tight four-week schedule, low budget, and Carpenter's limited experience as a filmmaker, but told Fangoria, quote, two things made me decide. One, Carpenter told me the story verbally and in a suspenseful way, almost frame for frame. Second, he told me that he didn't want to take any fees and that showed he had confidence in the project. Carpenter received $10,000 for directing, writing, and composing the music, Retaining rights to 10% of the film's profits. There. Because of the low budget, wardrobe and props are often crafted from items on hand or that have or that could be purchased inexpensively. Carpenter hired Tommy Lee Wallace as production designer, art director, location scout, and co editor. Wallace created the trademark mask worn by Michael Myers throughout the film from a Captain Kirk mask. Oh boy. Purchased for $1. $1.98 from a costume shop on Hollywood Boulevard. Carpenter called Hal Wallace, quote, widened the eye holes and spray painted the flesh in the flesh a bluish white. The script is said Michael Myers' mask had the pale features of a human face, and it was truly spooky looking. I can only imagine the result if they hadn't painted the mask white. Children would take their closet for William Shatner after Tommy got through with it. Hill adds 
that the, quote, idea was to make him humorless, faceless, a sort of pale visage that could resemble a human or not. Many of the actors wore their own clothes, and Curtis's wardrobe was purchased at J.C. Penney for around $100. Wallace described the filming process as uniquely collaborative, the cast members often, often helping move equipment, cameras, <coughs> excuse me, and helping facilitate setups. Halloween was filmed in 20 days over a four-week period in May of 1978. Much of the filming was completed using a steady cam, a then new camera that allowed the filmmakers to move around spaces smoothly. Filming locations included South Pasadena, California, Garfield Elementary School in in Alhambra, and the cemetery at Sierra Madre, California. An abandoned house owned by a church stood in as the Myers House. Two homes on Orange Grove Avenue, near Sunset Boulevard, in Hollywood, were used for the film's climax. A street had few palm trees, and thus more closely resembled a Midwestern street. Some palm trees, however, are visible in the film's earlier establishing scenes. The crew had difficulty finding pumpkins in the spring, and artificial fall leaves had to be used had to be reused for multiple scenes. Local families dressed their children in Halloween costumes for trick-or-treat scenes. Carpenter worked with the cast to create the desired effect for Terrence Suspense. According to Curtis, Carpenter created a, quote, fear meter because the film was shot out of sequence and she was not sure whether her character's level of terror should be in certain scenes. Quote, here's about a seven, here's about a six, and the scene we're going to shoot tonight is about a nine and a half, remembered Curtis. She had different facial expressions and screen volumes for each level on the meter. Carpenter's direction for Castle in his role as Myers was minimal. For example, when Castle asked what Myers' motivation was for a particular scene, Carpenter replied that his motivation was to walk from one side of marker to another and not act. By Carpenter's account, the only direction he gave Castle was during the murder sequence of Bob, in which he told Castle to tilt his head and examine the corpse as if a quote were a butterfly collection. Okay. That's a little weird. <laughs> anyway. Lacking a symphonic soundtrack, the film's score consists of a piano melody played in a 10 8 or complex 5 4 time signature, composed and performed by director Carpenter. It took Carpenter three days to compose the entire score for the film. Critic, Jean, critic James Rodinelli calls the score, quote, relatively simple and unsophisticated, but admits that Halloween's music is one of its strongest assets. Carpenter stated in an interview, quote, I can play just about any keyboard, but I can't read or write a note. In the end credits, Carpenter bills himself as the Bowling Green Philharmonic Orchestra for, the, for performing the film's score, but he did receive assistance from composer Dan Wyman, a music professor at San Jose State University. Some songs can be heard in the film, one being an untitled song performed by Carpenter and a group of his friends who formed a band called the Coupe de Villes. The song heard as Laurie steps into Annie's car on her way to babysit Tommy Doyle. The song is heard as Laurie steps into Annie's car on her way to babysit Tommy Doyle. Another song, Don't Fear the Reaper, by the classic rock by classic rock band Blue Oyster Cult, appears in the film. The soundtrack was first released in the United States in October 1983 by Veresi Cervante slash MCA. It was subsequently released on compact disc in 1985, re-released in, in 1990, and again in 2000. On the film's 40th anniversary, coinciding with the release of Anthology, movie themes 1974 to 1988, a cover theme by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross was released. Hmm, that's interesting. Now let's look at the influence. Now let's look at the influence of this movie. Halloween is a widely in influential film within the horror genre. It was largely responsible for the popularization of slasher films in the 1980s. Halloween popularized many tropes that had become completely synonymous with the slasher genre. Halloween helped to popularize the final girl trope, the killing off of characters who are substance users or sexually promiscuous, and the use of a theme song for the killer. Carpenter also shot many scenes from the perspective of the killer in order to build tension. These elements have become so established that many historians argue that Halloween is responsible for the new wave of horror that emerged during the 1980s. Due to its popularity, Halloween became a blueprint for success that many other horror films, such as Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street, would follow, and that others like Scream would satirize. 
The major themes present in Halloween would also become common in the slasher films and inspired. Film scholar Pat Gill notes that Halloween, that in Halloween, there is a theme of absentee parents, but films such as The Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th feature the parents becoming directly responsible for the creation of the killer. Mm-hmm. Oh, here. There are slasher films that predated Halloween, such as The Texas Chase of Massacre and Black Christmas, which will contain prominent elements of the slasher genre, both involving a group of teenagers being murdered by a stranger, as well as having the final girl, girl trope. Halloween, however, is considered by historians as being responsible for the new wave of horror films because it not only used these tropes, but also pioneered many others. Rockoff notes that it is, quote, difficult to overestimate the importance of Halloween, noting its pioneering use of the final girl character, subjective point of view shots, and holiday setting. Rockoff considers the film, quote, the blueprint for all slashers and the model agent which all subsequent films are judged. Mm-hmm, I definitely say so. So, well, this is just a really great horror movie, and it's definitely just... Oh, it's so good, I can't describe it. So, overall, I give Halloween five jack-o'-lanterns out of five. Well, join me tomorrow as we take a look at Halloween 2. Ha 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 ha. So, see you tomorrow, everybody. <laughs>